At the end of every day, there's something that you wished you knew earlier. The closing price of the stock market, the bad coffee lid destined to spoil your virgin white shirt. They're silly inconveniences when compared to getting home safely to your family. When tragedy strikes, it's easy to wonder about the butterfly's effect. If you took the time to give your kids an extra kiss, your wife an extra hug, if those few seconds would put you on a path that would preserve your life, if it's possible, in other words, to kill destruction by sparing a few seconds, aviation accidents can be like that. Add a second, subtract a second, sometimes it's the difference between living and dying. There's a striking picture of the pilot sitting on a Lamborghini in front of a Cirrus, a companion to a watermark of a bull climbing the stock market ladder. Life can be full of paradoxes. Described as a man of faith, he was happily married with three daughters. The names of his father and brother were prefixed with the honorific doctor, which means that education ran deep in his family. The pilot, apparently, followed a slightly more meandering path. A high school athlete who was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps, he eventually matriculated to computer engineering with Amazon on his CV. He wasn't done. He got an MBA along the way to becoming an entrepreneurial CEO. He flew his first airplane at the age of 15, though apparently he hadn't done much beyond that. Still, he loved aviation, he loved his family, and he loved God. It was a Cirrus SR-20, predecessor and little brother to the SR-22, the best-selling piston of the new millennium. The SR-20 was the first general aviation aircraft to be equipped with the full airframe parachute. You have two options when it comes to redundancy. Pay a bundle a la a second engine or get a Cirrus that can float to the ground. There's a funny thing that happens in GA with redundancy though. It can simultaneously reduce the accident rate while also leading to more fatalities. General aviation twins have suffered from this. The second engine theoretically will keep the plane flying until it can safely land in the event of an engine failure, but it comes at a particular risk. Asymmetric thrust creates tricky handling characteristics, which all too often result in the aircraft rolling uncontrollably and entering a dive, an event which is almost always fatal and almost always the pilot's fault. You might wonder what this has to do with a single-engine airplane with a parachute. A lot of people are surprised how often the pilot forgets to deploy the chute in the heated moments preceding the loss of aircraft control. Perhaps redundancy is overrated. Or maybe, like a lot of other things in aviation, it's only good if you insufferably drill yourself to use it. In 2011, the SR-20 and SR-22 had a better overall accident rate than most of the GA fleet while also proving more deadly. At 1.6 fatal accidents per 100,000 flight hours, it eclipsed the leading Diamond DA-40 by a factor of 5. Even the Cessna 182, a more relevant comparison, had a fatal accident rate less than half of the Cirrus. Confronted by this, Cirrus launched an aggressive training program which focused on the deployment of the ballistic parachute system. By 2014, the fatal accident rate was reduced by 74%, nearly matching the performance of the class-leading DA-40, which benefited from a slower, much more benign wing. A parachute doesn't do you any good if you don't use it, but that wasn't the only problem on the accident flight. It was a busy day in the pattern at Montgomery Gibbs Executive Airport in San Diego. Montgomery Gibbs Tower, 2540, Papa, holding short of 28 right, ready for takeoff, their pattern works with full stop. Taking out of there for cross to left contact ground. Turkey 904, I say again, cross to left contact ground. Straight left my contact ground, Turkey 4904. 904 without delay, traffic is short, final for 28 left. Without delay, 904. Now we're going to turn, I'm going to turn, say again. For 800, Papa holding short, 28 right, pad at work. Good into Zulu Tower, call base. I'm going to turn, right, you were stepping on me, say your full call sign. 4800, Papa. 800, Papa, Montgomery Tower, stand by. 2540 Papa, Montgomery Tower, you're following a series on the upwind, make right traffic, runway 2 right, quick takeoff. Right traffic, 2 right, quick takeoff, 2540 Papa. The accident airplane had been around the pattern several times with repeated practice landings, first to runway 28 left before transitioning to a right hand pattern for 28 right. The pilot was performing stop and goes, which are generally used by a student pilot on a solo flight around the pattern. More experienced pilots, or students with flight instructors on board, will often perform touch and goes, which allow for many more landings in a given period of time, at the cost of being more demanding. There are a few things that you need to know for the rest of this to make sense. November 700 Yankee Zulu was a sixth generation SR-20 equipped with a technologically advanced avionics suite. 
It's a dual-use aircraft that is used both for training and is a relatively capable cross-country platform. If you're thinking about a relatively high-performance and economical aircraft to use on business trips, and it's going to be your first airplane, it's hard to beat the SR-20 if you can afford the half-million-dollar price tag. The Air Force Academy bought 25 of them in 2011. They designated them as T-53As and used them for initial flight training. November 700 Yankee Zulu was built in 2020, at which time it was registered to a corporation. It was a sixth-generation SR-20 equipped with Cirrus's Perspective Plus avionics suite. That suite includes a GFC 700 autopilot with an option for Garmin's Electronic Stability and Protection System, ESP for short. The system is designed to provide both bank and pitch protection with the autopilot off by applying restorative forces on the side stick in the event that the aircraft exceeds 45 degrees of bank or 17.5 degrees of nose-up pitch. It will also apply nose-down forces in the event the stall warning system is active or during low but non-stall speeds when the autopilot is engaged. The aircraft, as most aircraft do, comes installed with a pitch trim system. This alleviates the need for persistent control forces to be applied when the aircraft operates at various speeds along its roughly 70-knot in-flight airspeed range. On the Cirrus, it's electronically controlled via a hat switch on top of the side stick. In the event of a pitch trim runaway, the only way to disrupt trim commands is to pull a circuit breaker. On a light single with a relatively small operating airspeed window, this isn't a problem. Cirrus details in the SR-20 Pilot Operating Handbook that even full deflection of the pitch trim system can be easily overrode by nominal control forces. They don't provide a specific number. Let's call it less than 20 pounds of maximum pressure on the side stick to maintain aircraft attitude with the pitch trim rolled all the way forward, nose down. Any more than that, and you'd have to question the legitimacy of Cirrus's phrase, easy override. Tower Cirrus 7, Sergio Yankee at 2 8 right in sequence for stop taxi back. Sir Yankee Zulu, make right traffic, runway straight right quick for takeoff. Straight right quick for takeoff, Sir Yankee Zulu. Sir Yankee Zulu, tower call base. Tower Cirrus 7, Sergio Yankee Zulu, I'm just here to left. Sir Yankee Zulu, continue downwind, tower will call base. Continue downwind, tower will call base, Sir Yankee Zulu. Thank you, Zulu Base approved. Zero, Papa, Tower Call Base. Call Base, Four Zero Papa. As a pilot, you know the pattern's full when the tower controller tells you that they'll call your base leg. They don't do that to add workload to themselves. They do it because they need to provide separation for a myriad of arrival and departures on the same runway. Four Zero Papa, you're looking for a Cirrus, so right base over the Gulf Force 1000, turn to report Cirrus in sight. Traffic, Four Zero Papa. Five three nine second runway straight right line up in weight traffic one and a half mile final Cirrus. Runway straight right line up in weight five three nine six echo. Thank you Zulu traffic off your left is for the south runway. Four zero Papa base approved is flying a Cirrus to beam your right. Right base approved four zero Papa. Okay. Right off. My trim is on. Trim is activated by itself. A pilot's ears will perk up when they hear someone say, "My trim is activating by itself." That's a flight control issue, an emergency condition every single time. The tower controller was nonplussed. You don't have to be a pilot to work in ATC. Most controllers know just a little bit more about aircraft systems than your third grade teacher. Trim is a thing that beautifies the side of a house. It would be easy to blame her, that's not my point here, but it's fair to say that she wasn't much help. In her defense, the pilot failed to identify his aircraft designation. It's such a standard requirement that it becomes reflexive for anyone who has spent any significant amount of time at the controls of an airplane. For a student in the midst of a mechanical abnormality, it can become an unnecessary inconvenience. I have a second right down on a third runway two right quick takeoff, so now everyone's making a right turn for the pattern. I have an emergency up and back trip in our final degree nine or six echo right down with departure. Just having a trim problem, you have a stuck mic on one the pilot used the magic word, emergency, but it appears as though the transmission was stepped on by both the tower and another aircraft who was cleared for takeoff. The controller was able to extract that someone was having an issue with their trim, but clearly did not hear the phrase emergency, which, though an example of clear communication, is itself not the prescribed way for a pilot to communicate a critical situation to air traffic controllers. If we're being precise, and this is going to be a good example of why a pilot should be, the appropriate phrase is mayday, mayday, mayday. There's a reason why you're supposed to repeat it three times. If you're stepped on or mumbling, it increases the chances that the controller will immediately give you their full attention. 
The pilot was stressed, confused, and alone. Even more, he was ignored. The controller had a packed pattern and was ignorant of how serious a trim issue could be. At first, she brushed him off, then she loaded him up. Steering keys will go around, offset north side. Steering keys will go around. Steering keys will offset to the right. The cause of her quick go-around command is not clear, but it had fatal implications. Maybe zero Yankee Zulu was high and in no position to land. Maybe the controller hadn't provided enough separation between the Cirrus and the Cessna that was taking off. Whatever the cause, she added fuel to a spark. The pilot was fighting aircraft pitch, and she told him to add power and climb. She also needed him to offset from runway centerline in order to avoid the potential collision with the departing Cessna. In other words, she loaded him up with tasks when he was already saturated. Pitch oscillations are clear in the video. Combined with the pilot's utterance of a trim runaway, it's clear that he had encountered abnormal flight control forces. There are four possible causes, two more likely than the others. Garmin's ESP doesn't read minds, but it's also a well-designed, robust system. Unless it was malfunctioning, it would not have introduced elevator forces, which could have been potentially mistaken for a pitch trim runaway, unless the stall Stop. warning system was already active. That warning Stall. includes oral alerts that are hard to Stall. miss and which were absent in the pilot's transmissions. Stall. Another unlikely initiator is a pilot himself. Over control of an aircraft often results in oscillatory wave patterns as the aircraft is displaced from stable parameters. The pilot overreacts with excessive control inputs resulting in exceeding stable parameters in the opposite direction and continues on in this manner until the aircraft departs controlled flight or they let go of the controls or they settle down. It's better to take him at his word, though that doesn't require that he was 100% correct. He clearly identified his belief that the trim was running by itself. It's unclear if he identified it on instrumentation or via control forces which were acting against him. There are three things that could have caused the resistance that he experienced. The first is, as he identified it himself, runaway trim. Going against this is a crash itself. His final panic maneuver belies a state of mind in which the pilot did not believe that he could control the aircraft. If Cirrus's POH is correct, and it's hard to believe that it isn't, the maximum control forces that he would have experienced would have been mild, easy for a former Marine to overpower. But you can't underestimate startle factor, especially when dealing with an inexperienced student. Overreactions are natural. Training and experience are the antidote, but you must survive long enough in order to learn the lesson. That last part comes down to luck. The pilot appeared to be fighting several battles simultaneously. He had little experience, he was operating in congested airspace, he experienced a mechanical issue, and he was vectored too closely in the pattern requiring a go-around at the worst possible moment. The activation of autopilot servos is another potential source for the initial pitch upset. Garmin's ESP system utilizes those servos, but it is an unlikely culprit given the programming architecture it's designed with. Yet there's also this going for it. The maximum downforce that ESP produces is 60 pounds. Grab a stick and let your four-year-old pull for all his worth, you're going to notice it. In an airplane, you won't have much hope of keeping the nose up, which, as it relates to a stall, is a point. ESP stall protection is essentially a stick pusher. It doesn't take an inexperienced pilot to respond incorrectly to its inputs. The captain and pilot flying on Colgan Air Flight 3407 had 3,400 hours of pilot time. He experienced a stick pusher event. In what can only be described as a startle response, he failed to recognize that the stick forces were associated with the stall protection system. He yanked back instead of letting the nose drop and accelerating. Here's the ADSB data, 112 knots downwind, 77 knots approaching the turn of final at a pressure altitude of 1,000 feet. After clubbing the throttle, he accelerated to 106 knots and climbed to 1,175 feet. He descended to the runway while keeping the power in. He had accelerated to 132 knots at 875 feet. He maintained that speed until short final. This explains the loss of separation between Zero Yankee Zulu and the Cessna that the tower controller intended to depart prior to his arrival. The Cirrus was 40 knots fast on final. The 77 knots during the base leg is one knot below Cirrus's published 78 knots for a short field landing with full flaps, and even that speed is only meant for crossing the runway threshold. The lower limit of the green arc on the SR-20 is 71 knots and represents the stall speed with flaps up at max weight and a forward center of gravity. With only one occupant, the Cirrus would have been well below max weight, which means that the stall speed would have been a couple of knots slower. A few things about stall speed. The published numbers are governed by FAR Part 23, which dictates airworthiness standards for manufacturers. It gets a little confusing here because stalls in airplanes occur not at a speed, but at an angle of attack, which is the angle between the wing and the slipstream. 
Most straight wings stall around 17 degrees. Stalling air speeds are specified as a matter of convenience. If the aircraft is maintaining 1G, 1 times the force of gravity, it'll stall at the specified airspeed in the specified condition. If the aircraft is maintaining more than 1G, which it will in a level turn, it'll stall at a higher airspeed. It'll also stall at a higher airspeed if the pilot buries the stick aft. An angle of attack indicator is much more reliable as it takes all of this into account in one instrument, but they're not installed in most light singles. The use of wing flaps lowers stall speed. 87 knots is a recommended threshold crossing airspeed in a zero flaps configuration. It's 10 knots lower than the pilot was maintaining on base. It's quite possible that the flaps are up during the turn. Post-accident video footage displays retracted flaps. It's possible that the pilot retracted them as a part of the go-around, but given the circumstances, it's probably not very likely. Similarly, an inadvertent activation of the autopilot system is unlikely, but not impossible. If the servos were alternately fighting against and with pilot inputs, it could explain the oscillatory pitch patterns down the runway. In either event, pressing and holding the red autopilot disconnect switch on the side stick would have de-energized the servos. That works on pretty much any aircraft out there. If something weird is happening to pitch control forces, push and hold that red button. It's not going to do you any harm. The final potential cause is that the elevator was jammed. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. In this case, control forces would have been abnormal and unresponsive, possibly causing the pilot to misdiagnose it as a trim issue. The upside of this theory is that it explains why the pilot may have become fixated on immediately getting the aircraft on the ground, even though it had to have been clear that doing so in a controlled fashion was next to impossible. Still, this theory contradicts witness testimony and surveillance video which depicted the aircraft oscillating as it overflew the runway. An aircraft with a jammed elevator will inevitably experience a fugoid causing the nose to oscillate up and down, but the period of these oscillations is generally closer to a minute than to the seconds witnessed in this case. So I'm hit, big plume of dust. Told ground, this is Rich Pickett, and I need to go to the site. They said, you're clear to go. When I got to the crash site, there was um, fuel being spilled, so I was worried about fire, but went and tried to help the pilot, the sole occupant. So it took a while for our fire department to get there. One of the issues is they couldn't get through the gates. They cut the lock, made it through the gate. There's a lot of the fire departments, they don't know about airplanes. They don't know about fuel types. They don't know about wings. They don't know about the rockets and the Cirrus. The parachute had not deployed. But the uh, firefighters here at the base of the tower are on frequency. Uh, if you guys want to head out that way to help, uh, it's approved. Now, all aircraft just stand by. We have personnel all over the airport right now. I don't want anything else happening. Whatever the cause, the pilot didn't have much time to figure it out, but he also had an escape hatch. The Cirrus parachute system comes with only one requirement for deployment, 133 knot speed limit, and even that is an absolute. This doesn't mean that altitude is not a factor. Cirrus recommends making the decision to activate the parachute at or above 2,000 feet, but also notes that altitude loss prior to full deployment has been demonstrated at less than 400 feet vertically. For this reason, there's no published minimum for deployment. In the event of a spin, deployment is required regardless of altitude. In theory, if he had activated the system while porpoising down the runway, he would have drifted to the ground at a much more survivable rate. Perhaps the equivocations in the Cirrus POH led him to believe that deployment at 100 feet was a death sentence. Nevertheless, it's hard to envision a scenario that would have prevented the aircraft from climbing. If he had retained enough control to gain altitude, he would have bought time to assess the severity of the malfunction and find a safe place to deploy the parachute if needed. Easy to say with all the time in the world to think about it. A man of faith, a father, a son and brother, a husband. Regardless of who's at fault, don't blame him. God bless.